sometimes the most vulnerable people in the world can easily become prey, especially to a predator who spends much of their time hunting, researching, and stalking what they refer to as the perfect victim. When these predators find their so-called perfect victim, they rarely set their eyes on anyone else. It becomes their obsession. John Edward Robinson appeared as what some would refer to as charming, friendly, and super outgoing. He grew up in a nice home with both parents and was even an Eagle Scout. He had four children with his wife, Nancy Jo, coached his kids various sports, and was a volunteer scoutmaster, as well as a Sunday school teacher. He was also a master manipulator. In the beginning, John Robinson set his focus on being a con man, faking his way through trade school and forging countless documents in an effort to gain status and embezzle money from countless businesses. He would also try to gain trust in the community by appearing to be a kind-hearted family man who would create outreach organizations to help those in need, the vulnerable, his prey. And in his search to find these vulnerable souls, particularly women, he would begin to take his crimes to a much bigger level than anyone could have possibly imagined, way beyond just being a con man. He had now become a predator, and he too would research and hunt and stalk his perfect victims. This is the case of serial killer John E. Robinson, and this is Gone in a Blink. Hey, true crime fans, I'm your host, Heather. And I'm Danielle. And this is episode 11 of Gone in a Blink. Today's episode is kind of shifting things a little bit in a different direction than we normally go. While we do try and focus on missing persons cases, we thought we'd mix it up a bit and cover what is considered one of the most horrific serial killer cases, not only in the Midwest, but in this country alone. Today, we are talking about serial killer John E. Robinson. So, if you're ready, let's jump right into it. John Edward Robinson was born in Cicero, Illinois. His father was an alcoholic and his mother was a strict disciplinarian. Being the third of five children, Robinson had siblings to look up to, but he started on his own path, never really heading in the same direction very long. By the time he was 13, he decided he wanted to become a priest, so he was enrolled in Catholic Preparatory Seminary. He even claimed that he would one day work at the Vatican. However, that dream didn't last long, and he ended up dropping out of seminary at the end of his freshman year. And to be quite honest, knowing what we know now, the venture was pretty far off from the man he wanted to be later on. His next venture would be enrolling in trade school to begin studying radiology. However, he would end up dropping out of that also after only two years. He did manage to get a job as an x-ray technician at a children's hospital in Kansas City, Missouri by forging his credentials. By the time he was 21, he had met a woman by the name of Nancy Jo Lynch, and together they would eventually go on to have four children. On the surface, Robinson appeared to be an all-around family man, but he would later be described as a master manipulator. After being fired from his job at the hospital in 1966 because of the fact that he was really had no idea what he was doing, he went on to work for a medical practice where he stole several thousand dollars and began having sexual relationships with not only the staff, but also the patients as well. So as we can already see that he's going down a a road that's not good. 
Even further, in 1977, while working for a handicapped service organization, he somehow got on the board of directors and created a, quote, Man of the Year Award, and after forging several recommendations, he ended up awarding it to himself. <laughs> so so talk uh, about, I think we're talking about a real... <laughs> his ego right. is and, through the roof. Well, Exactly. And how we just described, he's a master manipulator. I, I want to know how he manipulated his way so far up on the board of directors to, to get that title. I, a lot of things I found said that a lot of articles said that he was charming, which kills me because, I mean, obviously, I never heard the guy talk. Um, so maybe he just had a way with words, but looking on past photos of him there was nothing i could find remotely charming about this man but he managed to dupe a lot of women it was people that were less fortunate or people that were in need and he would entice them with things like a job or you know promising to take them all around the world let them see everything there is to see, you know, he would just entice them with things like that. So by 1983, John Robinson's crimes had drastically escalated when his brother, Don Robinson and his wife, Helen had unsuccessfully been trying to conceive a baby and were unable to adopt a child. Robinson told his brother that he had connections with adoption agencies. So he began a search for single pregnant women who could provide a child for him to sell on the black market. At the time he was searching for a single pregnant mother to provide him a child, he stumbled across 19-year-old woman by the name of Paula Godfrey, whom he hired to work for him as a sales rep for a couple of shell companies he created for the sole purpose of creating freight credentials for himself. This was in 1984, and this was believed to be when he committed his first murder as well. Soon after hiring Paula Godfrey, he claimed to have sent her away for training and she was never heard from again. Shortly after her disappearance, Paula's father confronted Robinson, demanding to know where his daughter was. However, Robinson stated that he had no idea what he was talking about. And soon after that, her family started receiving typewritten letters with Paula's signature on them saying things like, I'm okay, you don't need to worry about me. But no investigation ever ensued because there was no evidence of foul play in the fact that Paula was an adult. These typed letters with her signature on it, did the family recognize that as her signature? Yeah. You get, so yeah, that she, that was, was, she was really her. Yes, it was her signature. Later on, uh, we will we will talk about how he got these women to sign this stuff so so wow okay that this was kind of something that he he did so, so at this point the family is getting these signed letters and they recognize it as her signature unbeknownst to them of what's really going on so i wonder what the family thought probably it's painting the picture that she just ran off and didn't want to talk to them anymore but i'm sure that was so confusing to the family yes and that was Robinson's plan all along. I mean, he wanted, he didn't want family members to wonder where their loved ones were, or he didn't want anyone to be calling the police. So he would have, he would make up these basically blank pieces of paper and have them sign blank pieces of paper. And then he would do the rest, making, you know, write out whatever he wanted to write. Actually, it was typed. Um, it was always typed so that family members wouldn't recognize that, you know, this was anyone other than their loved one saying, don't need to worry about me. So then three months after Paula Godfrey disappeared around Christmas of 1984, Robinson claimed to have started the Kansas City Outreach Program, which was supposedly started to help women in need who were down on their luck. And he had gone to numerous shelters and hospitals in the area, getting the word out and talking to social workers about the program. Former social worker Karen Goddess, and I think I'm pronouncing that right, 
recalled in an interview with ABC News that he had contacted her and told her about the program and that they worked with young pregnant women or women with newborns and were designed to help these women get back on their feet. According to reports, Robinson called Karen sometime in January of 1985 and told her about a young woman that he had found at a women's shelter in Kansas City that had agreed to join the program. The woman's name was Lisa Stacy. Stacy was the mother of a four-month-old baby girl named Tiffany. And when he encountered Lisa Stacy, he introduced himself under the name John Osborne and told her that he could provide her with a job and get sent her to Texas where she would be enrolled in a training program that included daycare for baby Tiffany. Soon after convincing Stacy to take her baby and leave with him, Stacy's family received a phone call from a terrified Stacy saying, quote, they had deemed her an unfit mother and that her mother, Betty, had said she wanted baby Tiffany. The last words they heard from Lisa Stacy were the words, here they come, before the phone went dead. No one ever seen or heard from Lisa Stacy again after that. And two days later, Robinson showed up at his brother's house and handed baby Tiffany over to him with forged legal documents claiming Tiffany's mother had committed suicide. So... This is where his crimes go from just a con man to a con man slash murderer slash someone who sells a baby on the black market. I I mean, and maybe that's just me being a little naive. I didn't know that there was such a market for that into like the, the later 1970s into the early 80s, quite honestly. But I, I guess so. I guess so. I know... It's an issue now, but yeah, I, I guess back then, but you know what people, unfortunately people want what they want and, and they don't care where they get it from, but I will make no, I, I want to note that John Robinson's brother, Don and his wife, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but they didn't know where this baby came from. They did not know. John lied to his, his brother and said that. Lisa Stacy committed suicide. I don't even know if he used Lisa Stacy's name, but I'm guessing probably not. But he, they they had no idea. He he came to them with forged documents stating that this was an illegal or this was a legal adoption. And they didn't know anything otherwise and that will be proven at the end of the podcast that police had even mentioned that they believe that Don and his wife had any idea where this baby came from. Well, and of course, up until this point, they had no reason to think that he would lie or to go to that extreme to provide them a baby, forge documents. And so, and it's all a lie, all a con for what? I wonder what he gained from it. Not sure what he, what he had to gain from that I think that he was just he was so arrogant you know he was so arrogant it was like he knew his brother and his sister-in-law were trying to have a baby and so he's just kind of like hey I can take care of that for you you know that kind of that mentality and there was nothing that he would stop at you know there was no crime too big or small for this man he so it was I think it was just a big ego thing so the praise and admiration that he made this happen. Yeah. And that's, I think that was probably the motivation for him on this particular instance. So soon after this, Robinson began to submerge himself into the underground sex industry, getting involved in S&M type prostitution. And just to give a bit of insight into what that is, and I had to look it up because I wasn't quite sure but it's not in the for... s&m are you <laughs> no <laughs> and no offense to those who are but it stands for sadism and i'm not sure how to pronounce this mass masochism 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 anyway masochism. masochism that's what i was thinking but which i believe is Submissive sexual activity, basically, to sum all that up, that involves one being submissive and one is like the dominant one. 
So that's what he submerged himself into. It was reported that authorities had their eye on Robinson and had sent in a female undercover FBI agent to pose as a potential prostitute for Robinson. However, agents became concerned for her life and had to pull her out. So by 1987, Robinson was sent to prison for a theft conviction and he wouldn't be released until sometime in 1993. So that at least put him away for a little bit. But it was at that time that Robinson dove deep into the world of the internet when he got out of prison and discovered a new way to search for his victims where he would frequent numerous BDSM chat rooms and contact pages. And BDS, BDSM apparently stands for Bondage and Discipline, Sadism, and Masochism. In these chat rooms, he began to refer to himself as, quote, slave master and became known as the first serial killer to use the internet to hunt his victims which is very scary because now that is used quite often to hunt victims right and something we have to you know point out a little bit too remember unless i miss something he still has a wife and four children at this time so yes he didn't have all four of the children at this time but he did have children um, and yes, he had a wife. So he had a wife and kids at home. And so he was kind of leaving a double life, very similar to what I'm thinking now that the BTK killer did. He lived a life of, you know, he was a family man. He came across as appearing. I think that was his whole facade on the outside. He was a family man and he coached his kids sporting events and things like that. At one point, Robinson was a, a Sunday school teacher as well. So... That's kind of like how BTK was. He worked as a pastor and Boy Scout leader. And that's a whole facade to cover up what they're really doing behind closed doors. So while he was doing all of this, his wife supported the family by taking a job as the manager of the trailer park. that The family eventually had to move into after losing their home in the suburbs. During this time, Robinson had met a woman by the name of Beverly Bonner, who was the prison librarian and who was married to the prison doctor. Robinson seduced Bonner and talked her into leaving her husband, which she eventually did. He then convinced her to move to Olathe, Kansas, and had promised to give her a job at one of his made-up business ventures. And then he also convinced her to sign over her alimony checks to him, and immediately after doing all of this, Bonner vanished without a trace, and Robinson continued to cash in on her alimony checks for a good while after her disappearance. And when Bonner's former husband questioned Robinson on the whereabouts of her, he claimed that she had moved to Australia. So now this is becoming quite evident of what his motives are. His motives are money and how in the world he is so manipulative that he gets women to sign over all your alimony checks. Wouldn't that be, I mean, and I'm not victim shaming at all because he obviously had a way of convincing women to do things that maybe they wouldn't normally do. And I'm guessing this woman was probably a very smart woman, but she was enticed by him somehow and agreed to, to do things that would raise a red flag with most people. Well, like we had said earlier, single women. So that leads me to believe someone that wanted to be taken care of, especially that that era that our society is very, we, we probably wouldn't admit it to a certain extent, like we want a man to take care of us or that the, the man takes care of the family type of scenario. So I, I could see him trying to manipulate through that, caring for these women and then I would say slowly, but honestly, it doesn't seem that slow that, you know, he gains their trust. He's, oh, he's taking care of the the money for her, right? You think she'd be smart enough to, to figure that out. But who knows, you know, if he's providing stability, sexually providing. It, it sounds like he was taking on, like, their deepest needs. And they were just giving over to that because they trusted him so much. I guess they must have really trusted him. And this lady was a little different than what you will see 
the type of woman that he pursues from here on out because she wasn't a single woman. She was married currently. Now, what her situation was, I don't know if there was a vulnerability where maybe she wasn't happy in the marriage or or something of that nature, but he pursued her and she was married and her husband was the prison doctor. So it's not like he wasn't able to provide for her. So I'm not sure, but there was something about Robinson, obviously, because of the fact that he is, he was able to entice so many women that she couldn't resist. And she just, she fell for him and trusted and, and him, obviously. You said uh, Beverly Bonner was married? Yeah, she was married to the prison doctor. But you also said that he was cashing her alimony checks. Because he convinced her to leave her husband. And she did. And she got a divorce. So mm. she was able to get alimony. And that was his whole M.O. was to get her divorce. And then, boom, he's getting alimony checks. Well, there you go. I mean... That, that shed, to me, that sheds a little more light that he was providing something or promised a life that her husband at the time was not. So much that she left him, started getting alimony checks, and yeah, had this guy cashing them. That just goes back to how manipulative he really was. So in 1994, he met a woman, another woman, by the name of Sheila Faith on a social media site. And Sheila had a daughter named Debbie who was suffering from what some sources I found said spina bifida. And some sources claim she was suffering from cerebral palsy. And she was confined to a wheelchair. Robinson told Faith that if she moved to Kansas City, he would give her a job and would provide medical care for her daughter. This seemed almost too good to be true for Faith and... I can only imagine how difficult it is to care for a disabled child, much less to do it on your own. So there you go. There's that need again. So she took Robinson up on his offer in the hopes of making a better life for her and Debbie. Unfortunately, soon after the mother and daughter moved to Kansas City, Robinson killed them both and instantly began cashing in on Faith's pension checks. Oh, man. How, how many women are we up to now? I think this is um, the fourth, correct? We have Paula Godfrey. We have Beverly Bonner. We have Lisa Stacy, And we have, yeah, Sheila Faith and her daughter, well, Debbie Well, technically Faith. fifth because Debbie. Jeez. Mm -hmm. Well, by this point, there was no stopping Robinson, obviously. And by 1997, he met a Polish art student by the name of Isabella Lewicka on the BDSM website. Isabella was living in Indiana at the time. And in true John Robinson fashion, he managed to convince her to drop out of college and move to Kansas City. He got her to agree to become a submissive for him. Or basically his slave, like his sex slave. And claimed to let her be an intern for him at one of his made-up businesses. He then got her to sign a 150-year slave contract that 115 entitled... 115 year. Oh, 115, 115 year. Which, well, I you guess know, what's the difference? <laughs> what's the difference? <laughs> So that entitled Robinson to gain possession of everything she owned, including all her bank accounts. Two years later, in 1999, he killed Lewicka. Now, okay, to go back to this slave contact, I don't see how this would be submissible in court, but by any way, do you? What, that he, that she signed a contract? That she signed Oh, no. A, yeah. The, I mean, no. No. I, so I'm trying to picture this, that, okay, to the banks, for him to go there and to show some kind of contract that would give him that control, that that seems very odd to me. No, and I don't think that's what happened either. And I think just I psychologically that he, they signed this contract and she willingly gave over the bank accounts. Yeah, I think she totally willingly... If she's willing to sign a 115-year contract, first of all, I mean, obviously she didn't know what her future was about to hold, but 
he did. So what was the purpose of that when he ended up killing her two years later anyway? Well, to me, what it seems like is it's maybe a part of this practice of the BDSM. And and I think it is. Some of our, our listeners, you know, if they have more information on that, could could send some comments or, or emails that we'd have a clearer understanding. But, but that's what it sounds like that this is revolving about, around, especially in this case. They, I mean, that to sign that contract, I mean, she's just that much more submissive to him in that BDSM practice. I think so, too. And I think that is part of the practice. I'm not really familiar with their practices, but... Like you said, if anybody who is involved in that wants to uh, shed some light on that type of thing as far as signing a contract for something like that, then please, please feel free to to let us know about that because I don't want to give any misinformation. So the last known victim of Robinson's was a 28-year-old woman by the name of Suzette Troughton who worked as a nurse living in Newport, Michigan. She was a woman who he'd come into contact with on another BDSM website, and Robinson worked to convince Troughton to work for him by caring for his elderly father. Little did Troughton know, though, Robinson's father had been dead for quite some time. So soon after making the move to Kansas, she went ahead and made the move to Kansas, Suzette Troughton disappeared and was never heard from again. Once again, after her disappearance, Robinson would start typing letters with Troughton's signature at the bottom and sending them to Troughton's loved ones in an effort to make it look as if she was still alive and to not tip her family off into thinking that something was wrong. For quite some time after Troughton's disappearance, Robinson would use her email account to contact family and friends. And Suzette Troughton's mother, Carolyn Troughton, began receiving emails from her but did not feel that it was her daughter she was hearing from. The wording was different, and this became very alarming to Carolyn, so she called the police, and almost immediately a task force was initiated. Dave Brown, an officer investigating the case, said in an interview with ABC News that Carolyn Troughton asked them to find her daughter's beloved Pekingese dogs, which she named Pika and Harry. Police later discovered that two dogs were found abandoned at the trailer park where Robinson lived on March 1st, 2000, the same day that Suzette Troughton went missing. Wow. The dogs, yes. The dogs ended up being taken to a local animal shelter and later were adopted. While police were investigating Troughton's case, they made a visit to a family that had adopted one of the dogs that were found that day. And he called Pika by name and immediately the dog perked up and started wagging its tail and then ran to the detective and it was at that point that they were pretty certain that the dog belonged to Suzette Troughton and that she had more than likely been killed by Robinson. At that time Robinson was going by the alias J.R. Turner so he had many aliases. It was also at that time that authorities in both Kansas and Missouri began keeping a close eye on Robinson due to all the missing persons that were linked to him. During the investigation into Troughton's disappearance, police searched Robinson's trash where they found a bag of shredded documents. Investigators were able to piece together some of the documents and discovered that he had obtained a storage unit located in Raymore, Missouri. Police still continued to follow Robinson as he would go from woman to woman all over the country, putting them up in hotels. It was during this time that Robinson began seeing yet another woman by the name of Vicky, and she worked as a psychiatrist, but was laid off at the time. In early 2000, Robin arranged a meeting for her in a motel in Overland Park, Kansas. Authorities were staked out in a room next to theirs and could hear their sexual escapades sounding a bit on the violent side, which caused him to eventually be arrested and charged with sexual battery. I believe at this time authorities were looking for a reason to arrest him, knowing that there was more to John Robinson than just being a con man. But I don't know if they had any idea just how much more there was to him. As well, uh, Vicky would have been, I think, the eighth or ninth 
woman, I guess if <laughs> if you're keeping track, I think we're up to that she would be the eighth or ninth. Again, yes. to my understanding, he still has a, a wife at home, Nancy. You remember Nancy Joe? Yeah, still got so, Nancy. So, wow. During the time that Robinson was communicating with all these women and luring them away from their homes, he was telling them that they were going to be traveling all over the world, sailing in his yacht and living their best life. He would provide for them with several sheets of blank paper and tell them to sign the bottom of each one. This is what we were talking about earlier. A couple of things coming up now, right, that we're shedding this light that he's providing this life that that they haven't been provided for, just like in Bonner's case that she even broke up with her husband because of these promises, it sounds like, that he's making. And then going to those signatures where um, the family members are what seems to be a type letter from the victim with their signature at the bottom. This is how he got it. He provided blank sheets of paper and had them signed. You wonder at the time, if they thought that that was kind of weird. They probably you know that, did. I would think so. But, I mean, we're also talking about more of a practice of submission as well. We don't know if these women were getting caught up in that also. And maybe they thought that that was just part of the facade or the contract that they were portraying. He claimed that they wouldn't have any time to communicate with their families and this was a way that he could write every everything they were doing and all the adventures that they were going on and send it to their families back home. So there you go. So there Vicky, you go. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Vicky ended up going to police about the sexual battery and after a task force that was put together to track Robinson discovered that he began talking with a woman from Tennessee who he had just convinced to meet up with him in Kansas City and bring her eight-year-old daughter as well as the deed to her car. Police knew that they had to act quickly and that they could not allow the woman and her child to meet up with Robinson. So it was then that the police issued a arrest warrant for Robinson. Don Lawman, one of the investigators on the case... Oh, okay. Thank you. Don Lehman. And the reason why I know that is because she was one of the investigators on the case and she was also one of my teachers in college. Uh, really? She was, she was my forensics teacher in college. So yeah, so she, it was kind of cool. <laughs> that, that is kind of cool. So, you know, she was one of the investigators on the case and she said in an interview with ABC News that towards the end of the investigation, we learned that there was a young female that he was trying to lure down to the farm. And that's when we decided that we had enough and we were not going to let him go any further. Authorities had a plan in place with the fear that Robinson could lure one of the women he was contacting to his place in rural Lynn County. John Robinson was finally arrested in June 2000 at his trailer in the Santa Barbara Mobile Home Park in Olathe, Kansas. But for the time being, he was only being arrested for sexual battery of Vicky and another woman he had shacked up with in a hotel. When authorities conducted a search of Robinson's farm in Kansas in June of 2000, Cadaver dogs hit around some trash barrels outside of Robinson's home. It was reported that one of the investigators rolled one of the barrels out and this is, this is bad. So they rolled one of the barrels out and it has, as he was rolling it out, it fell and it hit the ground. And when it fell, a thin red line came oozing down the side of the barrel and they described it as when the red line oozed down the side of the barrel, a fly landed on it. And it was at that moment that investigators knew for sure that it was blood inside that barrel. And I would be, you know, as an investigator, your job is to open that, that barrel, which would absolutely terrify the hell out of me. Right. Because you know, you know, there's nothing good in that barrel. There is, you know, so 
they knew for sure it was blood inside. And so once the barrels were open, they discovered the bodies of Suzette Troughton and Isabella Lewicka. Investigators sent the bodies away for autopsies and moved on to Robinson's storage unit in Raymore, Missouri, where they found three more barrels. And inside the barrels, they found the bodies of three more of Robinson's victims, which included Beverly Bonner, Sheila Faith, and her daughter, Debbie Faith. Inside the storage unit, they also discovered a copy of a receipt from the Roadway Inn from 1985 with Lisa Stacy's name on it. Once they searched Robinson's home and office, they found several blank letters with Suzette Troughton's signature on them, as well as copies of letters that looked as if it was some kind of template for the letters that he would send to his victims' families. So, I mean, he had this, this is, he had all this planned out. Everything was meticulously planned out and templates made up and it's just sick. It's really sick. But Robinson was charged in 2000 with the murders of five of the women found in the barrels on his farm and his storage unit. While investigating, police learned that Lisa Stacy's daughter, Tiffany Stacy, whose name had been changed to Heather Robinson, had been adopted by Robinson's brother, Don. Through DNA samples and fingerprints, they determined that Heather, a.k.a. Tiffany, was in fact Lisa Stacy's baby. Police theorized that on a cold day in January of 1985, John Robinson picked Lisa and Tiffany up from her mother-in-law's house and drove them to the roadway inn where he bludgeoned Lisa to death. They believe it was from there that she made the frantic call to her mother-in-law. That's so sad. It's incredibly sad. There were more than 100 witnesses at Robinson's trial, and it took the jury less than a day to deliberate, and on October 29th, 2003, they found him guilty. He was sentenced to death, and because Robinson committed crimes in both Kansas and Missouri, he was tried in both states. So once trial ended in Kansas, he was tried in Missouri, where authorities offered him a, a deal. If he pled guilty to the five murders, he could avoid a death sentence. And in exchange for that, they were hoping that Robinson would reveal the location of the bodies of the other three women. However, Robinson, and this goes to show his ego, he refused to tell the investigators anything. So John Robinson is now 75 years old and sitting on death row in El Dorado Correctional Facility in Kansas. He is currently appealing his death sentence. And Kansas reinstated the death penalty. They haven't always had the death penalty, but they reinstated it in 1993, 1994-ish. But they rarely use it. And according to Wikipedia, no one has been executed in the state of Kansas since 1965, which really stinks because... He's on death row, and he will probably be on death row until he dies of natural causes or whatever. I don't see them executing him. He's been on death row, what, since 2000? And it's 2024. So he's been sitting on death row for 24 years. What it sounds like is even though he didn't cooperate with authorities in Missouri. It's almost like he still got the plea deal, though, because Kansas, they very rarely, you said 1965 was the last time that they had um, executed anyone in the state. I don't know. That that really upsets me. It's like, I mean... Yeah, it, it upsets me, too, and it upsets me that, that he's going to be sitting on death row, and they're really just going to let him sit there, and I don't know. But well, so I have a question. Do we know any further information about the original wife, Nancy Joe, or the kids? You, you had mentioned he had four kids, but it doesn't seem like that those had, had came up again. I don't have any additional information about the kids. I think, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think that Nancy Joe eventually divorced Robinson. But there wasn't a ton of information out on her either. And I guess if I put myself in her shoes, I wouldn't want to really talk to the media much. If you're married to a man that long and you find out that he he did all these horrific crimes and killed all these these women, I'd probably lay pretty low. 
Well, and that's so true that, I mean, just like he manipulated all these women, that I'm sure that he manipulated her too. And to find out all this information, who knows when she found out this information and if she already had had children with the man. I, I bet it, you know, it's very hard for her. Absolutely. And I bet she was just devastated to learn of all the horrific things that he did. Well, absolutely. Thanks for listening to another episode of Gone in a Blink. If you like our show, please consider giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And if you have an idea for a show you'd like us to cover, we'd love to hear your suggestions. So please email us at goneinablinkpod at gmail.com. And we'd love for you to follow us on any of our social media sites. And we'll post those links in our show notes. Until next time, please remember, stay safe, stay smart, and try not to blink.